แล้วทำพลอปอย่าตั้งสัญญาแล้ว just jump right in um, that sentence explains best what what AI is is good at like a sentence has what we all know a problem the brown quick fox jumps over the lazy dog does anybody spot the problem it's quick brown fox exactly wrong and of adjectives exactly and you know it and um, in 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 the English language there's with the proper order of adjectives, e exactly, and there's a, a rule for that, and we can state that. But usually, um, we, we just do it as, a, as humans, with, with our intelligence, whatever that is, um, intuitively. And that's basically um, what we try to, to grasp with AI, um, to learn like the human brain does, or l get some sort of that uh, that notion um, to m to s formulate solutions to problems um, where the rules are not explicit, not known, um, hard to code by hand. Um, here we have non-formalized knowledge, but order of adjectives is like semi-formalized, um, because if you, look, if you dig deeper what is an adjective and stuff like that, um, it, it becomes really, really hard and tricky. Um, or even knowledge not known. What you, can't know, what you don't know, you can't code, you can't debug, um, it's, it's really hard. And um, AI is something tackling that kind of problem, and it's a tool set where machine learning is one tool in that, in that tool chain. Um, and as Andrea said, I'm like, I'm almost 50 years old now, and I started um, my computer science studies in 1992, and um, I developed AI systems in, in, the, in the 19th, that's, that's where I came into Lisp. But AI it e is even, uh, even older. Um, it's the term um, artificial neural network dates back to 1943. Um, and the, the concepts behind that is like really, really old. And we are having that hype right now um, due to a number of facts, um, speed of computer, po uh, computer power, um, availability of data, um, because um, storage is so cheap, um, and stuff like that. So, from um, just to just to get you get, uh, to get you going, I want to talk about debugging and what you did if you if you have an AI system. Um, but I think it's it's important to talk about the same um, same stuff. So I'd just like to outline a, a typical AI problem. That's um, one of the things m m uh, artificial intelligence is, is famous for. Um, in the early days, it was playing chess. Nowadays, it's playing Go. Um, I think everybody knows AlphaGo, that um, tool from, from Google, um, where they demonstrated um, beating um, pro Go players. And the algorithm is pretty straightforward. It's so-called min-max. You're trying to minimize um, the gain for your opponent, and you're trying to maximize your own gain in every, every move. Um, so with a given configuration of the board, be it either chess or, or Go, um, you can make a move, and this configuration plus that move leads you to another configuration. And more moves means, or, or more different moves lead to different configurations. And to decide what to minimize and what to maximize, you um, assign each configuration a value, a, a rating. And the problem here is, which rating do we, do we assign to, to the different configurations. That problem is really well understood, sort of, um, for chess, where you have libraries for good moves for the beginning and good moves for the end. Uh, and in the middle, you have some rules you can explicitly state and, and codify in that, um, in that functions. But for Go, that's uh, really hard because um, Go has way more configurations to solve, and the good configurations are not well understood. Um, so 
Um, the branching of that of that search tree is like um, 231 in, in, in the middle. Um, so it's really co uh, compute intense, and uh, that, that function is not well understood. So what AlphaGo did was they played multitudes of Go games with basically random um, random functions and checked out what went good. Because in the end, in the end, you know the the functions. You know whether it's whether you won the game or whether you lost the game. And what they did is they propagated that result back through the, through the track. That's called reinforcement learning. And from that, they trained the neural network inside to learn that function for rating. That's basically what they did. So and um, sometimes I, I take the questions in between. Sometimes I'm uh, or here we'll, we'll take it in the end, so I'll just give you the answer. Um, I think Google chose that problem not because they like Go, uh, Go playing so much, not because, or not in the first place, because they wanted to attract bright people. Um, but that problem, or that, that kind of problem, you can easily transfer to the core of Google's business. Because um, what, what, um, if you replace Go with, I show an ad here, and the result is the customer buys stuff. Yeah? It's exactly their core business. That's where they're after, um, I think. Um, and the other thing uh, which w where, this, where this comes into play is navigation. It's almost the same. You just try to minimize at every step, not min-max, but to minimize the, the remaining of, the, uh, uh, of, your, uh, of your way or of the time you're for traveling. Um, so it's basically all the same, and it's basically coming down to core problems um, Google has and Google faces. So that's, that's the interesting part. Um, from a, from a broader perspective, um, you should take an AI approach for a problem, not only if the problem fits, you can't code it by hand, stuff, well, what, what, I, what I told you before, but also if you have a business case where it's making sense. Um, I see a lot of business case, or a, a, a lot of AI projects um, out of curiosity or out of the, the fear of missing out opportunities or whatever, um, but with no solid business value behind it. Um, that went bad in the 70s, that went bad in the 90s, and it will, went, uh, will go bad um, for, for those guys doing it now. Um, however, as you see, I'm doing it like for 25 years. It's still fascinating. Uh, I, there are pretty, pretty important use cases for that. Um, just pick the right project. Um, I told you Google is, is um, using artificial neural networks for that learning of that evaluation function, uh, and they're also using it for, um, in a deep learning uh, variant, um, for image recognition. Another core business opportunities for Google, if they're being better at image search, you're using it more and they can sell you more ads on that and stuff like that. And um, what I'm trying to tell you here is artificial neural networks are very, very simple. What you need is the mass of, of about, I think, the eighth grade is linear algorithm. Um, or even, even simpler than that, it's a weighted sum and a function over that. Because you have input nodes on the, on the uh, left-hand uh, side, where you can have your, your, your input either from your problem um, statement or, or your data, or from other network nodes. Um, and those have values uh, assigned, um, which are multiplied with the weight along that, um, that edge. Um, all the weighted, sum, uh, weighted uh, input is summed up, so you get a value, and um, you try to like um, use a function to bring it back into into range and a trigger function. Um, there's a function in that in that middle inner node um, calculating the, the output value and propagating it 
either to the, to the output or to the next uh, to the next neuron. So it's basically a weighted sum and a function applied to that. That's that's basically it. Um, and that that simplicity is fascinating, um, but it also has some some attributes. Um, you can you can use or which will which will lead to to problems. Um, so on these problems, I'll I'll try to help you tackle now. Um, remember the properties. Pro um, AI is good or machine learning is good um, for problems hard to code by hand, with no formalized knowledge, with unknown knowledge, um, with uncertainty um, associated. Because if at that at that input you don't need to have uh, zero or one like binary, but you can have any value and uh, work with that. So you can one way you can asso uh, associate uncertainty with that. Um, and the next thing is um, which I which I left out is stuff changing rapidly. We'll come uh, to that later on. Um, but those property ma properties make verification and debugging of AI systems inherently um, hard, because if you can state the rules and you don't know the exact answer, you can't write test cases for that, or not, not at as easy as, uh, as normally. Um, I have two, two examples for that. The problem with, with unknown truths, I'm coming from, uh, from medical, com uh, medical informatics, um, and we had yeah, an expert system diagnosing um, uh, d diverse um, stuff. Um, so hard thing is, what's the correct diagnosis? And what is the correct um, therapy, which is just an another um, diagnostic problem. And it's hard to get the right answer from any, from any medicine practitioner. Because um, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes um, they're, they're treating you with, with, um, with something and um, see if it works. And by the by your reaction of your body to that therapy, um, they gain new insights changing the, uh, the diagnosis. So it's inherently a hard problem. Um, and if you think, hey, okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to save lives, I'm not trying to, to cure cancers, same is true for your customer support story. Um, if, you, if you have a call and try to answer stuff um, with the help of a natural language processing um, system, diagnosing whether you are helping your customer or not, you have the same problem. If he hangs up, the system doesn't know if you solved his problem or is just frustrated. Um, and the the other thing is, on the uh, the other bigger problem is, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence just replicate what's in the data, and this may seem as uh, very very straightforward because data is your program, um, basically. This is a this is a very well known example. Um, if you if you train um, Virtuvec um, systems on Wikipedia, you get that that thing where you can like calculate with concepts because it's basically vectors of uh, uh, you, you're dealing with, and you can like subtract vectors and add, uh, add vectors, and you basically can do stuff like that where where you can say king minus man plus woman is queen. Um, if you train the system on, on Wikipedia, you'll also get um, doctor minus man plus woman is a nurse, because that's what in what's in the text you're training your system with. And this is a this is a bias. We all know about it. Still, still it happens. Still, um, stuff is trained that way. Um, you might remember when, when Google trained their image source and, and uh, they had problem with people of color um, because they trained mostly with white people. Um, you might remember um, uh, Microsoft who released a Twitter uh, bot like I think two years ago and it took about f 24 hours to become racist, macho, and, and they, they um, had to shut it down. And basically, um, 
I think it was at that point in time when Microsoft, which for, for people my age is like the enemy, <laughs> um, um, totally changed gears. And it's the only big corporation with a really, really interesting um, machine learning and AI ethics group, um, which is like, I, I think, in part um, related to that, to that Twitter incident. So what to do if that, though it doesn't happen to you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, we all, as, a, as an industry, um, adapted some, some practices over the last like 20, 20 years or so. Um, from, from extreme programming over agile and stuff like that, we, um, we invented test-driven development, um, all those unit test frameworks were, were really big. But remember when I said artificial intelligence is really old? All those mechanisms is, were developed before that. So nobody thought about that. And still, if you develop an artificial intelligence uh, system, you train it, you run your training cycles, which is really a lot of effort, and in the end, you have to check whether it's, whether it's good. And you can't go back in and switch a little unit in, inside. Normally, you have to throw it away and retrain it all over again after you found the problem, obviously, but because still, if you do the same thing, it will lead to, this, to, the, same, to the same bugs. Um, also, you have a higher dimension of failure space because you're um, you're having your system, um, your codifying, which is your machine learning system, but with the data on top, so it's a higher dimension you're dealing with, and that's making it uh, really, really hard. Um, and here's another typical problem stemming from what I, what I told you be before um, with, that, with that artificial uh, neural networks they lead to some substantial um, problems because they are built that way. Because if, um, if you want to influence the outcome, you can just go back to the path to that input neurons, track where one output uh, value comes from, um, because it's just weighted sums, um, and manipulate your input in a way it triggers a specific outcome. Now, this is what happened here. This is a really famous um, example uh, from the early days of, of Google's computer vision system, um, where um, I don't know who it was. I think it was Carnegie Mellon, but I don't know, don't remember. Um, they, they 3D printed that turtle model, painted in a, in a specific way, and that system um, assign the label, it, this is a rifle, on every angle. You can turn it, you can twist it, like in, in every way you, you hold it in the camera, the system said, this is a rifle. <laughs> um, here, this is fun. Um, like two years ago, um, a cybersecurity company named Silence had the idea of transferring neural networks to cybersecurity, to detecting um, Malicious, malicious code, malicious binary um, samples, which is a nice idea. I think it's not the only uh, company with, with that idea. Um, but researchers found out you can take um, known good examples, binary code from World of Warcraft, um, by the way, and they injected it into known malware samples. And the system was triggered by that known good code and um, that, that unknown malicious code um, was just not important enough or not, not detected good enough. So the, the um, World of Warcraft binary pulled that trigger of this is good code um, so, much, so much up that it, um, the system said, this is good code, and they could do it with, with almost any, um, any malicious code example, because that's the way an artificial neural network works. Uh, if, you, if you give it a sample, 
it just it just calculates um, the way through, um, and it might not end up the way you'd, you'd like it. So we need some new qu quality management approaches. We need some new debugging approaches. And from uh, from what I what I told you, I, I think it's. Um, it became clear you have to understand your model requirements. You have to understand what's the problem I'm tackling. Because that computer uh, um, security um, company never, never would have chosen that kind of solution if they knew about the problems in the first place. They just didn't think well about it. It's good for labeling, pictures when it's not important. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you have been to, um, um, to that auto tech uh, conference last year. There was a Google guy showing that, hey, we can, we can do that image search and you can, you can use it. And he was throwing in a, a picture of Angela Merkel. And the system stated, like on the, on the second most confident level, um, this is German Reichskanzler. I don't know where they trained it from. And I, uh, basically, who cares? At that, at that point, if you just make it for a demo, it's, hey, it doesn't matter. If you have that kind of system to decide um, whether to prolong the sentence of, of someone in prison, that's a bad idea, obviously. So um, you have to understand what's your problem. And what's the way to tackle it, F both from the, the ethical standpoint and the technical standpoint? And um, one example where we did it, uh, um, where we did it wrong in, in a project of ours, not at Data42, but in a company I worked before, we had to classify documents. It was really, really um, fancy shit right now. Um, all insurance companies are trying to do that. All banking uh, companies are trying to do that they're getting lots of applications. And they want to screen it automatically. Um, so to, to improve the speed of deciding whether one gets a credit or a credit card or whatever. And um, we're, we were trying to detect what type of document is coming in. Um, is it a bank statement? Is it whatever? And extracting information from, from these. And it's easy to distinguish your, um, your identity card from a bank statement because it's of the size of the, uh, and, and the color of, of, the, of the stuff. So here's really easy. But do a, mm, uh, to detect whether, um, whether that bank statement is tampered with or not, for example, is really, really hard. And even for that, um, for that problem, when we extract the information, um, you have to OCR it. You have to re recognize the characters, which is also done using um, neural network um, solutions nowadays. Um, those are not 100% perfect. So in that overall solution cycle, you, you need to be aware um, that almost every document will have a failure, and you have to cope in your system with, with that kind of, of problems. That should be rather obvious also. Um, you, have to, you have to have a quality management on your input data. As your input data now is your problem, uh, is your program, is, your, is, is what constitutes your, your system in the end. You have to apply the same techniques you're using for your code. You have to version control it. You have to quality, quality maintain it. You have to make sure what comes in, what stays out, stuff like that. Um, this, is, this is basically um, a hard problem, because unlike um, source code, you, we're talking about huge amounts of data. So versioning huge amounts of data is like a hard problem nowadays. Um, I'm Sure. Yeah, dvc.org is, is one tool which is trying to cope with that. Um, there's lots of stuff in, in, in the making um, here. Um, pick the one matching your problem because it's 
totally different whether you're storing um, structured data, unstructured data, text, pictures. Um, you have to find your, your right solution. But make sure you have a version control of what goes into your system. Um, also, try to visualize your data. Try to, try, try to get uh, an idea of what's in the data um, to, to learn what your system might detect. Um, that's a nice story from three, three four years ago, um, where people tried to like, explain why a neural network decided um, how, what kind of picture it is, what, to lab what, to, uh, what label was put in. And they did it by highlighting regions in that, in that pictures. And the example was going like, um, we put dogs and wolves in, and the system learned what, what labels to assign to, to new pictures. And when the uh, researchers like, used their, their tool, it highlighted not parts of the dog, but the snow, because all the input data from the wolves was pictures of wolves in snow, because that's what you get stock, get stock photos from. Yeah. Um, basically, <laughs> I, like I'm referring to my age again, um, the same story um, was, was there in the 90s when some military tried to, to, re tried to identify tanks. And while training, they had pictures of tanks on plain field and other stuff. And while testing it all, while, while, while in use, no military force puts a tanks right on, on, them, on them field in plain sight. They're trying to hide it. So it was in the woods. But the system learned, OK, wide open space, blue skies, tank. Anything else? Not tank. Uh, Basically, the same happens over and over again. That's why I'm reiterating that basic idea of look at your data and understand what's in it. Sometimes it's easy, because you can look at pictures. It's just the sheer mass of stuff. Sometimes it's, it's hard, because looking at bytecode is not so, not so fancy. Um, you have to pick the, the right tooling for, for what, you're, what you're looking at, but do it. Yeah, it's really, really, really important. And understand where your, where your images are coming from. If you're, if you're taking photos from a stock photo, from pixels or whatever, um, you're getting photos from, remember who put them in there, for what use, um, to, to get a grasp of what bias might be in there and stuff like that. Um, the same is basically true for, um, for stuff you create from technical systems, because technical systems in the, in the front have, uh, have problems. Um, so you're, you're basically learning their problems. Um, yeah. The next thing um, also has been having to do with, um, with, your, with your input data. Um, be aware that for supervised learning, learning from examples you put labels on, um, you have to have supervisors. You have to have someone telling you this is what it is. Um, sometimes you need a panel of people because of the, no, you remember that medical problem, one physician has one opinion, three physicians have three opinions. Um, we used to have um, a, a board of, of um, for physicians, because it's really hard at the university to get get more people in, um, and you you learn a lot of stuff about the experts, um, because it's uh, it's basically a hard problem you're you're trying to solve here. But you have to have it. Um, I every now and then I I think it's every four or five months five months I. I read papers or, and see advertisements for, hey, we are labeling the data for you with an automatic approach, so you can use that automatically labeled data with your system to learn what you need. No, nope, that's not how it's working. How it's working. Um, 
One way to cope with this is to use generated data. Why? Because you know the patterns in the data. You know what your system is supposed to find. But just don't use generated data. It's not the only source of truth. We had to learn it the hard way because we um, had that, yeah, in that in that document, we generated the documents um, and we generated pictures of those documents. And um, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the picture size was one, or the picture ratio um, was one input value. And as we generated like different kinds with the same template, what happened? The system was perfect. The system had a 100% score. Yeah, because it had only to pick one value to decide which kind of document we had. Now, if you ever see a machine learning system having 100% suc success rate, <laughs> be aware it is a failure. <laughs> okay. Um, you have to cope with, with probability logic or with, with that, um, yeah, not, not having the right answer for everything. Um, and, and build test sets um, where, where you know how your system's beha behaving and watch over time. Because I, I said earlier, one of the main points to use machine learning is if your problem changes within boundaries every now and then, um, and your, your learning mechanism can adapt to that. But if you're doing that, make sure the adaption doesn't go, doesn't spiral downwards. Um, there are several ways of coping with that, having lower boundaries of, of acceptance um, or acceptance a, a, a certain value of drop uh, for, for every single step. Um, that's something you have to cope with. It's very, sp very specific to, to that reiterating problem, so I'll, I'll skip that. I'll just keep that in mind. If you have that kind of problem, um, you, you have to cope with that. Um, and not for that uh, reiterating problem, but for, for, for any problem, um, be aware that the next generation or the, the next run of your system will not have the same failures. It will also have failures. It, it won't, won't be perfect. Remember, when it's perfect, it's wrong. Um, it won't be perfect, but it won't have the same mistakes, because otherwise um, you won't have to, to retrain it. Um, it's you're trying to get it better and, and making that, that error smaller. So you have changes in that, in that error cases. We talked about that on taxonomies and, and examples. And if you, if you hand code it and know your examples, you, you can count basically or, or see um, which, which strings uh, are, are mismatching. And with machine learning systems, stuff will mismatch, but in a different way in the next iteration. And this is my, my most, my favorite tool. Work with specific tools, yeah, oh, hey. obviously. Um, this is, it's a, a uh, collection of stuff which you can't use for every problem. Um, I, I'll tell you an anecdote. A friend of mine um, had in his, in his thesis, he wanted to model so, um, soccer games. Uh, um, does anybody know uh, RoboCup, where you have small robots l walking around and kicking, kicking balls? Yeah, you can have that in a, in a virtual environment also. And the, um, that's virtual league for that. And he was trying to like, model and train all those tiny little agents to play better football. And he had, on one day, um, a perfect, remember, perfect? A perfect team. They scored and got uh, got no goals in. And he was like, now I'm done. Um, but remember that perfect, every time it's, it's perfect, it's wrong. Yeah? Um, we had a, a visual inspector for what those agents were doing while they're playing. And watching the, ga the games of that, of that team, um, we saw, okay, we had several agents. We had the, the team players, we had the ball and we had the goal 
or basically the gold posts as agents, so they can count. And he didn't switch on the, this is immobile flag. <laughs> so the goal <laughs> of a team basically learned to move away as soon as, as the ball is coming in. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, but you have no way of finding out that stuff if you haven't a tool for visual inspection of what's happening in your system. And that's, that's very specific. Um, it's also true if you try to train a system in a virtual environment, because um, all those physics engines are having specific problems and your AI is like basically trying to find out the loopholes in that physical simulation engine to get better and not to solve your problem. That's funny videos on YouTube you can find um, on, on when the AI outsmarted its create, uh, creators. Um, basically, the creators just didn't know there was a bug in the physics engine. But that's hard to find if you can't inspect your running system. Um, that's, that's very specific, um, but, this, but it's um, the last resort. And last but not least, I'm always astonished, it's not the first time I'm, I'm giving this talk. This one is always a, you're right, we didn't think about it, um, at a safety net. Sometimes it's very, very easy to have a safety net. Um, remember that, that Uber car, um, which, uh, which hit that, um, that woman crossing the, the dark street. Um, they drove, I think it was a Volvo, and that Volvo has a, an emergency brake system. And Volvo stated, um, after an analysis of what happened, that emergency brake system would have detected the obstacle and would have stopped the car in time. But Uber decided to switch off that safety net because it could interfere with their machine learning system. This is the dumbest idea I've ever, s I've ever heard when talking to someone about machine learning. Um, have a safety net, because there will be failures. Um, something which is just research right now, but is very, very famous in, in, in Europe because it is about to become part of the legisl legislation. Um, and explainability. Explainability of, of, of machine learning is sometimes, sometimes really hard, because it's hard to explain what a deep neural network is, is working on. Um, so there are different approaches. Um, even training another neural network on explaining what the first one did, um, which sounds crazy. Um, but I, I think uh, stuff, stuff uh, interesting to watch what's happening in, in, in that space because it's, it's really, really um, thing. I just um, added the, the first link because it's really hard topic. And last minute, I have two more slides, I have two things. Um, <laughs> if you take nothing out of, that of, uh, out of the talk, this and the next slide. Use machine learning only if you're able to afford a non-zero failure rate. If you're deciding whether you should shoot someone, prolong a sentence, drive in a crowd of people, be sure to know what you're doing. And the next one is, turn it the other way around. My favorite spot of applying AI is when it's not used to automate stuff, but to derive new knowledge. That's possible, to learn about our biases, for example, by making stuff explicit, or by identifying virus outbreak stuff or whatever. If you can, if you can use it as a tool to derive new knowledge, that's, that's where AI is uh, shining. Thanks. Thank you, Christian. So we have, I think, three minutes for questions left. So are there any questions? I will bring the microphone to you, and please use the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if we need to use black box algorithms. 
So like um, it, they gain, they give us a lot of power, but like you said, it's also very dangerous. Um, so um, my question is: Is it ethical to use it? Um, um, there are probabilistic mo uh, modeling approaches as well, but are they not powerful enough? Or what do you think? <laughs> um, depends on your problem, I think. Um, sometimes there's not an ethical question because, for example, if you if you have um, the Google Suggest box and it's it's adopting to the trends um, of what people are searching, which is suggested to you. Who cares for explainability? Um, you have to exclude some stuff you, you don't want to show, or Google doesn't want to show, porn, violence, whatever. Um, but this is a problem outside of that learning context. You have to have it a, around that learning context. Uh, having, having black box inside that is perfectly fine. Um, making vital... I yeah, let, let's state that way. Making vital um, decisions based on black box it is not okay. But that's also true if it's not machine learning as a black box. Because um, rem remember that, that Boeing 737 MAX, they crashed because they chose to use just one sensor and instead of two, have a technical system which is not, which the pilots weren't trained upon, stuff like that. It's just basic technique, whatever. It's not, no machine learning in it, but it's unethical to use it that way. So I think that ethical question is not completely separated from, from the machine learning question, but, but also not identical. Um, yes. I, I hope that's okay for you. Yeah. Yeah. And you had one last question. Uh, hi there. I found your discussion about uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, the reinforcement learning being a really good fit for advertising. Really, really fascinating. Um, I've got a question about uh, kind of problems in general with it that people say AI is a really good, uh, good fit for. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific problems you see commonly being described as solvable problems by AI that are really, really bad fits for the existing commercial players that would otherwise be very, very socially useful? Is there one that springs to mind? That yes, um, using AI in, in HR context. Trying to assess people using automated systems will basically rob them from their individuality. And, and it's nothing we should do with, with technical systems. If you, if you try to assess people, have some other one in, in front of them they can talk to and they can then, uh, that's, that's how I see it. That's basically a bad idea to, to automate it. I, I see the I see the business point of, of, of that of that discussion because um, that they are uh, introducing it at IBM with 300,000 employees. Um, they're introducing it at the UN, screening one and a half million applicants, I think, every year. So I can see the need for tooling there, but I think. Using AI for screening this is, is the wrong approach. It's basically digitalization the wrong way. So thank you very much, Christian.